the number four right on your program. This is uh, Luis Mendez, and he will be presenting on the correlation between the oil price and the value of the dollar. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. Good, afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Thank good you. Afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I need to say that to catch everybody's attention. <laughs> so, why am I here today? Here, I'm here today to discuss this topic that I've been researching for the past semester. The topic that I choose was the correlation between the U.S. dollar and oil prices. Now, my, some people might say, well, why? why are you choosing to research that topic? For starters, I needed a topic to research <laughs> which I intended to do this homework, uh, to do this project. But the reason I chose to uh, research this topic was to see how the U.S. dollar can affect uh, the pricing of a commodity, this commodity being the oil. oil. So before I looked into uh, researching uh, this topic with data, I first wanted to look up background knowledge on this topic. So I looked up articles, read them, about 10 articles that I read concerning the relationship between the U.S. dollar and oil pricing. Out of eight out of the 10 articles that I researched, uh, it stated that there was a negative relationship between these two variables with various degrees of strength. Now, for those who don't know what a negative relationship means, that in simplest terms, one variable goes up while the other one goes down. The other two articles that, uh, out of the 10 uh, mention how both variables had a positive relationship. <coughs> However, the data they collected was before the year 2000. So this was before the crisis, financial crisis be, uh, in the early 2000s and the mid 2000s. So in order to do this project, I obviously had to collect data. So I collected my data and I used Excel statistical tools and formulas to see if there was a relationship between these two variables. So I sought out my data, and through the Bloomberg terminal, as you can see, <laughs> uh, I took the weekly spot rate for the U.S. dollar and the weekly price rate for the oil, for oil prices. I used the DXY or Dixie or the U.S. index, as well as the uh, as well as WTI or the West Texas Intermediate crude oil prices. This data was taken over the past three years, uh, beginning from February 2019 to March 2022. <coughs> Using this data, I was able to find descriptive statistics for both variables. The dollar index had a mean of around 56.8 and the standard deviation of 18.7. As opposed, uh, wait, the dollar index, sorry, the dollar index had a mean of 93.8 and a standard deviation of 2.8 as opposed to crude oil prices, which was 56.8, and the standard deviation being 18.7. Now, you may look at this like, what are these numbers telling you? <coughs> the mean explains the central tendency, because this is where most of the data was being found, and the standard deviation explains how far uh, some outliers deviate from the central tendency. So when you look at the dollar index as a standard deviation of 2.8, okay, it's not too big of a gap between the central tendency and some outliers, as opposed to the standard, uh, well, as opposed to the crude oil prices, which is around 18.7, which means is that there was much more volatility in crude oil prices as opposed to the dollar index. So I continue to do these uh, data um, analysis, and I was able to find the correlation between these two variables, which was negative 0.324. Meaning that this data, well, this correlation was a negative one, as I explained before, one goes up, one goes down. However, it was a weak one. In order to be a weak one, it had to, well, it had to fall under this number, 0.45 or negative 0.45. This was 0.324, negative 0.324. So it's a negative one, but it was a weak one. So okay, so this probably could have been uh, the end of my project. I found the correlation, I did what I was supposed to do. However, I didn't feel there was enough evidence to uh, uh, conclude this, so I had to go run some tests. So I used the absolute value of correlation coefficients as, as well as the t-test in order to see if there was enough evidence to conclude that this, was, this correlation was accurate. <coughs> in terms of the absolute value test, in order to pass, the correlation coefficient had to pass the critical value 
of 0.197. So the absolute value of my correlation, negative 0.324, was uh, 3, 0.324, which passes the absolute value test. One test down, another one to go. For the t-test, I made an hypothesis. My low hypothesis claimed that there won't be a correlation. However, my alternative did claim that there was going to be a correlation. <coughs> so my intervals were set at negative 0.197 and 0.197. And my t-value had to fall out of this region in order for the, uh, in order for the null hypothesis to, uh, to be false and to, for my alternative, uh, alternative hypothesis to be true. So it was valued, my T, my T for the T test was valued at negative 3.38, which meant that my null hypothesis was incorrect, and I had to go with my alternative hypothesis, which meant that there was a correlation, or there was sufficient evidence to claim, well, sufficient evidence to conclude that there was a correlation between these two uh, variables. So this project was meant for me to seek out uh, and find the correlation between these two uh, variables. And I found that there was a weak negative correlation. This falls in line with other articles that I found about this topic. However, I cannot stress this enough. Just because there is a correlation between two variables does not mean there is a causation. Very in fact, the reason why, well, the real reason why one variable went up and the other one went down was due to geopolitical uh, uh, issues as well as supply and demand. So if oil if oil prices went up or down, it wasn't because the dollar uh, the dollar the U.S. dollar value was going up. It was from other factors. And on that note, I would like to thank everybody who came out here to listen to me uh, present my uh, findings. And I would like to give a special shout out to Professor Alexander for helping me throughout this uh, semester. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. He's excellent. So this is, this is a group sitting here. They work very hard the whole semester to put this work together. And you know that in a lot of countries, students don't graduate until they do their presentation. So when we just studied the program the way Dr. Boachi was explaining, we were doing it independently as well, like other countries. And I said to Dr. Boachi, I doubt our students will do it the way they do it in the other countries. Because when you're looking at 80% of the students from other countries, they never get their degree because they never finish their project. So they will need the, they will need the coaching. And they were always there. We started with 11, and uh, eight best finished. So now we're going to listen to Gaia. We did a fantastic job as well. Gaia. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Frederick, and today I will be presenting my capstone project on the correlation between oil prices and inflation. For those of you who don't know, correlation is a mutual relationship or connection between two or more variables. So it basically tells us what kind of relationship, if any, exists between two or more variables. The reason why I chose this topic is because I wanted to test the long-standing relationship between oil prices and inflation in the face of a changing economy and recent unprecedented events. To conduct this research, a quantitative analysis was performed using a random sample of 100 pairs of data, and there were two variables. My independent variable, which was the average monthly oil prices of WTI, which is the West Texas Intermediate. Um, the data from, for that variable was obtained from the United States Energy Information Administration website. And my dependent variable, which was month over month inflation, the data for that variable was obtained from one, one of these very Bloomberg terminals. <laughs> Um, in order to conduct this research, I had to analyze 10 research papers on the same topic, and nine of these research papers found that there was a positive correlation between oil prices and inflation with varying degrees of strength, while the other one differentiated the effect between net oil importers and net oil exporters. 
that paper found that there was no correlation between oil prices and inflation for net oil exporters and an occasional negative correlation between oil prices and inflation for net oil importers. The quantitative analysis that was mentioned earlier has two parts, a descriptive statistics part and an inferential statistics part. And the, um, the descriptive statistics part, I was able to find information about the data such as the standard deviations and the means. The standard deviation of the data tells us how dispersed the data is with respect to the mean. And the standard deviation for the average monthly oil prices was 22.95, and the standard deviation for month over month inflation was 0 0.26. It's a big difference. However, this difference could be explained by the fact that while month over month inflation um, is a number that's released monthly, oil prices, they fluctuate daily. And those daily prices were computed to find the average monthly oil prices, which is the data that was used in this research paper. And so because oil prices fluctuate way more, the higher standard deviation makes sense. Um, I also found the mean of the average monthly oil prices, which was $69.61. And the mean for month over month inflation was 0.181%. The second part of the quantitative analysis is the inferential statistics part. In that portion, I was able to find the correlation coefficient, or which is noted R, and it was 0.1963. This denotes a weak positive correlation. This number, this correlation coefficient, was tested both with an absolute value of R test and a T test. In the absolute value of R test, I had to compare my um, correlation coefficient, which was 0 0.1963, with the critical value of 0 0.19. And because my correlation coefficient was greater than the critical value, um, I had enough evidence to say that there is a significant correlation, linear correlation, between oil prices and inflation. For the t-test, my t-statistic was 1.982. It fell in the rejection region, which means that I had to reject the null hypothesis, which claimed that there was no correlation between oil prices and inflation, and accept the alternative hypothesis, which claimed that there was a significant correlation between oil prices and inflation. Overall, the results from both tests confirmed that there was a significant linear correlation between oil prices and inflation. In the inferential statistics portion, I also found the coefficient of determination, or R square. The R square tells us what percentage of the changes in month over month inflation are explained by the movements and oil prices and per an R square of 0 0.038, um, I can say that roughly 3.8% of the changes that happened in month over month inflation are explained by the movements that happened in oil prices. In conclusion, I have enough evidence to say that there is a weak positive correlation between oil prices and inflation. This weak positive correlation simply means that when oil prices go up, inflation tends to go up and when oil prices go down, inflation tends to go down as well. My results are in line with the majority of the literature review findings, and therefore it solidifies the longstanding relationship between oil prices and inflation, even in the face of a changing economy and recent unprecedented events. Thank you. So you feel like you're watching any major conference. If you travel, you go to major conference. There is no difference, right? Fantastic job, fantastic job. For those of you, they are saying that Bitcoin is the future, right? Now, a lot of you want to invest in Bitcoin, right? You want to make money. So now, there's a gentleman coming up here. And he's such a nice guy, right? Jefferson, right? <laughs> Jefferson will be talking about uh, you know, there is uh, something called the volatility index to show you how much the something going to move. So he says, he's going to show you, he's going to explain how the volatility index can, pre can predict, I don't want to butcher your research, right? Can let you know what the volatility index can show you what's going to happen to the price of Bitcoin. Let's give it to Mr. Jeff. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Sharpus Navila, and bear, bear with me. My uh, my speech isn't going to be as good as my other two colleagues. So. <laughs> um, I'd like to start off with my topic, which is the potential correlation of the, the Bitcoin volatility index and the Bitcoin pricing. I simply chose this topic because everyone here loves Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and I want to learn more about it and potentially invest in it. So this was a, a greater means to my possible money-making future. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to start my presentation with what exactly Bitcoin is. It's, um, it, it was created in 2009, and it, it was created for, it was created as a means of exchange between various different people and it was created to serve as a new way for people to trade and simply because they didn't want a third party to be involved in different, different currencies. So I wanted to start off with my quantitative review, my literature review, which is exactly Eight out of the ten literature reviews actually stated that there was a significant correlation between the volatility index and the price and the pricing, while two of them actually <coughs> indicated that there was no correlation and it was simply due to outside factors such as the financial bubble. Now, a financial bubble is actually when a price of a asset is over evaluated and it simply continues to rise until it suddenly bursts and that price goes back to its actual market value. So I'd like to start off with um, my my data and excuse excuse the nerves. <laughs> <laughs> That's like we're all gonna bite. <laughs> <laughs> I like to start off with the data that I got, and I conducted a quantitative analysis using descriptive and inferential statistics, and. I actually conducted a random sampling in order to avoid any biased results. So my data um, lies between February, 2000, February 24, 2019 and February 24, 2022. That all leads me to my, uh, my results, which are the, the mean, standard deviation, the uh, level of confidence, my, my significance, the, this, uh, the level of significance between my two variables. So with that, with that in mind, I actually got the, the mean and the standard deviations for both my variables. The mean is simply the central tendency or the average of both of the variables, and the standard deviation means how susceptible the variable is to volatility, and having a large or a short uh, standard deviation means how close or how um, spread out the variables are in terms of the data. So the mean of the, uh, of the Bitcoin uh, pricing was actually 576.84, and the mean of the volatility index was 22,308. While these numbers seem very large, and they are, in, in, uh, more specifically the, the pricing, the volatility index and the pricing um, for the standard deviation they're actually pretty close to each other in terms of the, the mean. The standard deviation for the volatility index is actually 189,812. And because it's a little far, further apart than actually it's supposed to be, the value is more spread out and more susceptible to the volatility. While the standard deviation for the currency is 18,215, which is a pretty large value. So I did a kurtosis for both of my variables, and because the both of the results for those variables were negative, it turns out that there is a my uh, my distribution for both of the variables was lighter tailed in comparison to a normal dis normal distribution, which is a, a bit more um, not lighter. <laughs> So with a 95% level of confidence, I can state that the population mean for both of my variables is 
range between 539.1753 and 614.512 and 18,694.43 and 25,923.28. What the level uh, what the level of confidence indicates is that because we don't know what the level of, uh, population mean is, we simply want to indicate that it lies between a certain pair of numbers. So th that's what those two values mean. Um, and that leads me to my correlation coefficient. And unlike my two colleagues, my correlation coefficient and my t-stat are the opposite. So my correlation coefficient actually indicated that it was a negative correlation or there was no linear correlation because it was simply negative 0.13. 87, which indicates that there is no linear correlation because it's uh, closer to a zero than it is to the one, or a negative one. And my t-stat result was actually negative 1.38, which is uh, in the rejection region, and that simply means that I have to reject my null hypothesis, with this, which is the um, there's no linear correlation, and I have to accept my alternative hypothesis, which is there is a correlation, which is very interesting, I say the least. So at the 5% level of confidence, I can say that there is a significant correlation between both of my variables. And what does that mean? So about 1.93% of the variation in the volatility index can be explained by the uh, variation in the Bitcoin pricing. And an astounding 98.07% is still unexplained. So there's a lot more to research in the future. <coughs> While I calculated the, the scatter plot, I also got my, my regression equation, which was negative 13.317.16 plus 29,990.720. And when I manually did it, I got a similar result to that. It was, it was a, a couple of numbers off, but it was still similar to that. And the correlation of the determination that I got for both of my numbers was 0 0.01925641. I also calculated the standard error estimate to make sure that I wasn't too far off from what I actually did, and I did that manually and with the help of the, with the, help of the, um, the Excel. I managed to actually get the exact same number, which was 18,131.44657, which means that the value falls from the regression line because the value is simply too large, and that there is a lot of var var variability in the population, and there are so many different samples that I had that simply did not give me the same, the same mean values. On the other hand, if you have a smaller standard error a smaller standard of error, that means that there is no unit in the population. And that would indicate that the sample mean is actually closer to the population mean. This leads me to my conclusion, and I'd like to thank you all for my stum uh, listening to my stumbling mumbling. <laughs> While the initial question of this whole presentation was to simply indicate if there was a potential correlation between the Bitcoin um, volatility index and the Bitcoin population, uh, the Bitcoin uh, pricing, it was determined that there was enough significant evidence to indicate that there was a correlation between the two. And it also lies in agreement with eight out of the 10 um, literature reviews that indicated there was a correlation and it rejected the other two that said it was outside factors. As one of the leading cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin has seen a prominent rise and because everyone wants to get in on Bitcoin and make more money off of it, no one really pays attention to the volatility that comes with it. One day it could be $10,000, the next day or next year it could be 5000 or it can even have a more prominent rise like in COVID, where it went up like $20,000 to 68000 And this year it's gone down back to like 40000 So because these two are actually correlated, doesn't mean that it's actually the cause of it. There has to be another underlying purpose because uh, to this. And I want to further continue this research as I continue my 
financial path in the, in the world. Thank you, Dr. You don't want the pizza to be cold. <laughs> so uh, we're going to tell them what you are looking for, what you're searching, and what your result. Are you in line with the literature review? You can do that in five minutes, everybody. Oh, exactly. So now we stay with Bitcoin, right? So, you know, researchers, they're always looking for variables to test. This time, Jasmine wanted to test the correlation between Bitcoin price. Is it, does it have something to do with the value of the euro dollar exchange rates. So good morning, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. My good name afternoon. is Yasmin Akuna and uh, my topic is about the euro dollar exchange rate and the Bitcoin. I choose this topic because I believe that would be benefit for any investor to know if there is a correlation between the two variables. In case they have an investment in both and one is performing bad, they will want to manage the portfolio. Mm -hmm. I did a literature review, and most of my literature review found a positive correlation between the euro dollar exchange rate and the Bitcoin. To perform my research, I, I did a quantitative analysis. I picked 100 of daily data for each of my variables from Bloomberg Terminal. <coughs> and uh, I used the descriptive and inferential statistic in Excel. So let's discuss about the result that I found in my descriptive statistic. I will focus on the mean, the standard deviation, and the courtesy. The mean is basically the average. It's the sum of all the data points divided by the number of observations. So the mean for my X variable, the euro dollar exchange rate, is 1.13. And the mean for my Y variable, the Bitcoin, is 47,437.74. The standard deviation is basically how much my data point deviates from the mean, the distance between my data point and the mean. So a low standard deviation means that my data are close to the mean, and a greater standard deviation means that my data are far away from the mean. So the standard deviation for my x variable is 0 0.016, which is a low standard deviation. And the standard deviation for my y variable is 8,659.35, which is also pretty much a low standard deviation. The kurtosis tell us about um, the tail of the distribution. A low kurtosis tend to have lighter tail, and a greater kurtosis tend to have heavy tail. So both of my variables have low kurtosis, so light tail. In the second part, the inferential statistic, I found the coefficient of correlation. The coefficient of correlation tells us about the relationship between the variables. Either a positive correlation, the two variables are going in the same direction, and negative correlation, the two variables are going in opposite direction. I found the coefficient of correlation of 0.52, which is a positive correlation. I tested my coefficient of correlation by two ways. First of all, I compared the absolute value of my coefficient of correlation to the critical value. The critical value is 0.197, and the absolute value of my coefficient of correlation is 0.52, which is greater than the critical value. So I have enough evidence to conclude that there is a positive correlation between the euro dollar exchange rate and the Bitcoin. Once again, I tested my coefficient of correlation by the T statistic test. So I found my T value, which is 0.52 again. And uh, since 0.52 fall outside the re rejection region, um, I reject the null hypothesis, which state that there is no correlation between my variables. And I accept the alternative hypothesis, which state that there is a correlation between my variables. So based on both tests, I can conclude that there is a positive correlation between the euro dollar euro exchange rate and the Bitcoin. So I did a, co a calculation for the coefficient of determination. The coefficient of determination tells us about any causality between the two variables, like how many percent of change in x falls the change in y. I found the coefficient of determination of 0.27, which means 27% of change in euro Euro USD, Euro dollar exchange rate for the change in the Bitcoin. So in conclusion, based on the result of my research, I can conclude that the, there is a positive correlation between the Euro dollar exchange rate and the Bitcoin, but there is no causality between them. So thank you for your attention. Very good. Very good.
And we're gonna we are moving fast so that we can get the pizza, huh? <laughs> and we're gonna have Erica out of bridge. Erica gonna go a little bit away from Bitcoin, right? She's gonna go in something that's pretty new, people don't use a lot, exchange traded funds or mutual funds. So which way do you go if you wanna put your money out? And that's what she was looking at. Go ahead, Erica. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Otterbridge. Good afternoon. My research is about which would be a better investment, ETFs and mutual funds. My purpose for this research is to see if the two funds have a correlation and which would be a better investment for investors. For my research, I use Google Scholar and the Bloomberg Terminal. Um, I reference uh, 10 papers, and out of the 10 papers, all found that ETFs outperform mutual funds based off the benchmark. Um, the benchmark is set by the market that measures the performances of uh, different securities like stocks, bonds, ETFs, and mutual funds. Yeah. Um, you're good, you're doing good. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. You're doing good, you're doing good. Um, so, with that, um, so with that, I found in my, my data, my research, that ETFs on average outperform the benchmark set by the mutual funds on average to target the benchmark, which is approximately 15%. And um, I use descriptive and uh, information statistics to analyze my data. Descriptive statistics consist of quantitative data analysis, which helps describe the data and it puts uh, large amounts of data in, into a more simplistic view. Um, descriptive statistics can be measured by the central tendency, which is the mean, the median, the mole, and standard deviation. Within my research, I found that my ETFs. Um, average mean was three hundred seventy-four dollars and eighty-three cent, while my average mean for my mutual fund was um, sixty-two dollars and seventy-three cent. So with the standard deviation, that tells us how far our data deviates from our mean. So um, within my research, I found that my X variable, my ETF, had a higher standard deviation of thirteen, while my ETF, I mean, while my standard deviation for my mutual fund had a standard deviation of, of three. Um, so with that, I also use inferential, inferential statistics to um, come up with conclusions for my data. And with that, I use histogram charts, um, time series charts, and, and scatter plot charts. With the scatter plot the chart, I use it to see if there was a linear correlation between the two variables. And basically, a linear correlation is a straight line. Um, that leads me to the linear regression, which um, shows the relationship between the two variables, and it also um, shows a, a change and an increase or a decrease um, within the Y variable when the X increases. So, next would be uh, the coefficient determination has a, a value of um, 0 to 1. And um, basically what that tells you, it tells, tells, you, it tells you how the predicted values and the, sorry, the predicted values are the values on the regression line and the observed values of the rest of the data within the scatter plot chart. So if you have a, a lower R squared, like some of my, uh, my classmates did, that lets you know that your data is further apart from from the regression line. Oh yeah, uh, predictive values, I should say. It's further apart. Um, compared to if you have a, a, a higher um, R squared, your data would be closer to the regression line. So within my data, I found that my um, R squared was 0.994, which means that 99% of the variation within my Y um, variable can be explained by um, my X variable. And, um, and also that my data points are closer to the regression line compared to, like I said, someone who has a lower um, coefficient determination R squared with the data points to be more separate. Um, so with that, I was able to find that um, my two variables um, have a very strong positive um, relationship, and that's based off my correlation coefficient, which uh, has a value range from between negative one and one. And my coefficient, co my correlation coefficient, or my R, I should say, was 0.999. That's how that's how I got the really strong positive correlation. But that also lets me know that as my X increases, my Y also tends to increase. So my X would be my exchange trade funds, and my Y would be my mutual mutual funds. So in conclusion, um, I was able to determine that ETS would be a better um, option to invest in the mutual funds and also the, the direct cause and effect between the two variables. And my study 
um, comes from a third variable, which is the S and P 500 indexes, which I I, I measured the ETF and mutual fund based on that. Very good. You know who she is, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Stacy Alford. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> she is, right? We're very closer to you. And then also, there is somebody who's in the room we want to give a big shout out to. So, well, past finance students. Mm -hmm. And she's Gaia's sister. And she did a great job in her presentation, I thought, right? Mm -hmm. We're glad to see you. I didn't realize you're sitting in the back, right? Mm -hmm. All right, our next presenter, if somebody doesn't have a question, if uh, the next presenter would be Wenda Bo, right? And what she's looking at is, if you are an investor, where do you want to be? Would you want to be with the uh, S&P 500, which, which investors love a lot? And or if you want to do currency, right? And she want to look at, she want to look at the exchange rate between the U.S. dollars and the yuan, and how this is performing. How do they? What's the correlation between it and the S&P 500? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lidi Medrago Wendabo. Uh, my, my, my study was to see if there is any type of relationship between the exchange rate and the stock market. Uh, I chose this topic because I want to see what factor can affect my investment and that can be helpful for investors who want to diversify their portfolio and invest in different countries. My, my, my ex is the SM. The U.S. The U.S. Take your time. Take your time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my my ex is the U.S. dollar Chinese yen, and the Y is the S&P 500 index. I'm performing a quantitative analysis, which has two parts: the statistic, the discrete statistic, and the empirical chart. I have 100 data sets that I got from Google Terminal and 10 articles from Google Scholar. My data range are from January 2021 and February 2022. I did a literature review to see what other researchers did, and, I've, and seven of the 10 papers that I read found there is a negative correlation between the exchange rate and the stock market. That means the up and down of the currency can affect the stock market. In my descriptive statistic, I have the mode. The mode is the value that appears most often in the data, on the set of the data. For the US dollar Chinese yang, I have 6.38. And for the S&P 500, I have no mode. That means there, no, there is no repetitive data for the S&P 500. Uh, also, I have the standard deviation. is the dispersion of the set of data. For the US dollar Chinese yen, I have 0 0.02. That's very small compared to the S&P 500, who has uh, 126.43. It's more spread out, and uh, the S&P 500 has a large volatility. The correlation describe the correlation describes the degree of which two variables move in coordination with one of another. The correlation coefficient is between negative 1 and 1, and I found in a negative 0 0.22. That shows a ne weak negative correlation, a relationship between the US dollar and the Chinese and the S&P 500, meaning the two assets move in the opposite direction. I also perform a t-test and I found a negative 2.13. That's fall outside the interval of the critical value. That is negative 0 0.197 and 0 0.197. So I have en enough ed evidence to attest that is, there is a correlation between the two values. As the US dollar Chinese yen increased, the S&P 500 tends to decrease. My research can align with what other found and I have enough ev evidence to, to conclude there is a weak negative correlation between the S&P 500 and the US dollar Chinese yen. This paper was a, a learning process. I learned a lot in Excel, in Excel also, in, also in statistics. I'm grateful for all of those people who are doing with my paper. Thank you so much, Professor Alexander, for your time. It was a great privilege to work with you. Good, right on point.
And we're gonna call Miss Roberts McCor. We're gonna go back to Bitcoin again. What's the question now? Everybody's saying, you know what? Is Bitcoin gonna be the next goal? Right? So a lot of people do when you are investing, you always call gold the safe haven. So if the market is not good, you get the gold. Now people are looking at Bitcoin as a safe haven. So that's what she's gonna be discuss. Okay, so I'm super nervous. <laughs> That's all right. We are family. Good, good, good afternoon. Hi. Hi. My name is McCall Roberts. Some of you know me. Some of you first time seeing me. And like you said, I'm doing Bitcoin and gold. Bitcoin um, previously is a cryptocurrency, and I chose gold. The reason why I came to Bitcoin and gold is because I started with Bitcoin and inflation. So when looking for previous research. All the comparisons is Bitcoin and gold. And like you said, are they both safe havens? Is it good to invest in both during the volatil the volatility of the market? So when I went to do the research for Bitcoin and gold, it was hard to find research that looked just at them and the direct correlation. A lot of it was Bitcoin, gold, and oil, and how they operate, Bitcoin, gold, and the US dollar, and foreign currency. So I chose to make I chose to make um, Bitcoin the dependent and gold the independent. So during the time of research, um, I used from March 2019 to March of this year. Good job. You're <laughs> doing great. You're doing great. No, I'm nervous. <laughs> That's all right. You got a good and results. It, it was you daily. Results daily data from Monday to Friday because Bitcoin goes all seven days but gold only goes the five days. So I calculated the mean which is the average prices and gold was $1,745 and Bitcoin was $32,876 was the average price. So I also calculated the, st the standard deviation which measures the variation of data in comparison to the mean or the average of the price. So the gold standard deviation was $169.83, which um, reveals that there's some variation, but not a lot, in comparison to the standard deviation of Bitcoin, which was $18,198.55. So I moved on to calculate the correlation coefficient, which is the R, and it came out 0 0.68, and that's a strong positive correlation and I didn't think my claim was that it wasn't going to be a correlation and because why well, I thought that was because Bitcoin was invented so recent and gold been around since BC so I calculated if you see my Excel there's pages and pages of calculations to make sure that it came out right because I just didn't believe it but the numbers are right Excel is right so um yeah they have a positive correlation. And in conclusion, the relationship of Bitcoin, they both go up together and they both go down together, but it doesn't, it doesn't prove that gold influences the price of Bitcoin. And like the other research, they do, they do like fluctuate, but they're, they're stable. So I would say that it is a safe haven like the other research, even though that wasn't my project. So in conclusion, Bitcoin and gold have a positive relationship, but they don't directly influence each other. So thank you. I wasn't here for like a month of the semester. COVID almost took me out. Dean Kirkland, you looked out for me. So I really appreciate you guys. It was hard, but I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> And the last one, everybody, the last one, which is, you know, companies always looking for places to invest, right? Outsourcing is a big thing. Now, our last presenter, our last researcher wanted to look at, does inflation can discourage a company to come? So he's going to look at inflation in Nigeria and foreign direct investment. Mr. Suleiman. Thank you, Professor. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Suleiman Sawadogo. Uh, my research is about inflation and foreign direct investment. 
Um, the goal of the on my research is to find any type of relationship between these two variables, and then to see if the foreign direct investment and the inflation, um, if one influences the other. To conduct this research, I review um, ten articles, and most of them found that there is a weak, uh, weak negative correlation between inflation and the foreign direct investment, uh, which is mean uh, when inflation goes up, the foreign direct investment goes down, and vice versa. Uh, I, I collect uh, 50 yearly data points from a macro trend .net and Bloomberg for uh, inflation and uh, the foreign direct investment. And from it was from 1970 to 2019, just before COVID. <coughs> and to conduct this uh, research, I use a, a quantitative statistic, descriptive, and infer inferential statistic. Okay, I will start with the with the with the mean, which is considered like the average of data set point and the standard uh, and the standard deviation. Define how the data are spread, are spread out around the mean. So, for the inflation, uh, the mean is 0 0.18, and the standard deviation is 0 0.16, which is pretty close. Uh, for the for a direct investment, I have a mean of 2.01, and a standard deviation of 2.48, which is mean in both cases we can say that there's a low volatility. So. Uh, for the inferential statistic, I choose to uh, um, to analyze the level of confidence, 95%. We can say that the population mean of inflation rate tend to be between 0.14 and 0.22%. With the confidence level of 95%, we can see the population mean of the inflation is uh, between one point three and uh, two uh, it, this is about the foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. So it's between one point three and two point seven billion a year. And the T test the T test showed me uh, we are for the T test I got negative one point sixty two uh, comparative to a critical value of zero point one ninety seven I can reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. But it doesn't confirm that there is no correlation between inflation and foreign direct investment. To get more evidence, I calculate the coefficient of determination. Um, the R square gave us uh, 0 .05, yeah, 0 0.052, which is mean that 5%, around 5% of the variation in inflation rate will cause changes in foreign direct investment. And 95% uh, are uh, in the split. So the coefficient, the correlation coefficient, which is uh, negative 0 0.22, uh, tells me that uh, the variation, the inflation rate doesn't affect the foreign direct investment. Based on my analysis, I have enough evidence to say there's a weak negative correlation between inflation and foreign direct investment. And based on my finding on my literary review, I find the same result earlier, and I can say that um, it goes in the same way. Thank you for everything I learned about in this class. Thank you. Now, if the turn of the professors were here to give you an E, what's your comment? Anybody has a comment uh, on the presentation you just saw, Miss Happy? Yes, sure. You give everybody uh, an yeah. A. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just going to say I've studied finance uh, as an undergrad and also for my MBA, and I can just say that what you've done is on part with what we will do at a higher level. So be confident in your work, be confident in your presentation. This is a testimony of the education you're receiving here and also of your hard work. So 
congratulations. I was really impressed. Thank you. Ms. Nephew, you are the advisory board for the business department. She got a long Wall Street experience, and uh, she's here to support you today. Professor, you have a comment on the students? Well, for, the 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 for the second, yeah. absolutely an A. For the second year <laughs> in a row, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with the, with the quality of the work. And um, I, I think I said this last year as well. What, what comes from these conversations are more questions, you know, about, about the unanswered questions that, that relate to more research. And it's a wonderful, wonderful start. Well done, everybody. I thought it was great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander. Excellent job by you. Um, in such a short period of time to bring these students to this level is outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, now I'm going to go to the best. I would say the best for last. <laughs> Students, awesome. Awesome. I know you're a little shaky. I know you're a little nervous. We don't count that. All right? The knowledge and the confidence you had, um, the effective organization of your presentation, um, the fluidness of how you try to present your, your project, awesome. I'm not sure I can do as good as you. <laughs> but I'll keep working on this. Great job. Mr. Chair, do you have a comment? No, I think everyone did a great job, and uh, it was a pleasure listening to all, everything you had to present. Professor? Um, what can I say? Um, I sat there and I was, I was blown away by the quality of the, the presentation. And it, it's a testament to what we have here at SS County College. This is a great place, and we need to market this place much better. And we, to have, we need to have more than one section of finance classes. We can have more uh, opportunity for us to teach these students. So, uh, you know, I, I'm ready to work, and I'm here to work and serve. And whatever we need to do to recruit more students to fill this program, count me in. Okay. In fact, uh, I'm impressed with the performance of the students. I say congratulations. Okay. Um, so I sat there, you guys threw me back to my <laughs> dissertation days. I was hearing correlation, quantitative analysis, reliability, volatility, and you guys did absolutely well. And there's no difference from somebody who's presenting an MBA or thesis. So you, you, you killed it. All right, so a thumbs up for all of you. First of all, it was awesome. You guys, you guys did a great job, and it made up, it made me proud of you and about and everything that we're doing here in school, because I think it, it it's wonderful all together. And I also wanted to say that to, to sort of echo what was said before, this is a great start. You all had research in which you said. Okay, I, I, I could explain a portion of what's going on, but I can't explain all of it. This is an opportunity, right? As you move forward in your education, use that as the basis. And let's see if we can find out what the other pieces are that are causing those things to happen. You guys will have no trouble getting there. <laughs> you, professors. Well, I was really impressed. I think from Ms. Allegridge, that was one of the best explanations of uh, linear regression and scatter plots that I think I heard, and I could really visualize it, but all the students did fabulous. I think I'm going to take all of my dollars out of the <laughs> and, uh, and try to go for Bitcoins and commodities <laughs> and Fortune 500. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to what I said very early, and I'm very proud of you, McCall. Thank you. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. <coughs> Essex County College staff and team took yes. the opportunity <coughs> to bring this technology to our students at our college. Look at what we reap from that hard work. This is magnificent. This is what a community college is about, and you are what I consider exceptional student, go out there and sing the praises of Essex, that I learned this at Essex, take it wherever you go, as she said, and as she said, you are equipped and you can do it. And that's all I have to say.
you know, for me, numbers is not my thing. Mm -hmm. So when I hear you, I'm very impressed. And I'm, you know, when I'm seeing the other professors talk about the brilliance of your work, it makes me very happy. Uh, my job is to see that you get into a good four-year college. That's just some part of me that says, how can I get you into a good four-year college? Some of you went to Caldwell, some go to Seton Hall. And I know this for a fact. Our top 1% students here are top 1% at Rutgers, Caldwell, Seton Hall, and they go on to shine. So what you are receiving here is top-notch, right? And it's just a matter of you now running with what you've learned over here and excelling in life. So thank you, very impressive, and I wish you all the best. Very good, congratulations guys.